Good morning, everyone. My name is Asaf. I work for the Wikimedia Foundation, um, and I'm just facilitating this session. Uh, we will try to keep to the time frame. Uh, we have two presentations, each with its own question and answer period, and then three lightning talks that will have a joint question and answer period at their end. We should have enough time to get some questions in. Um, so, without further ado, uh, I want to present the first speaker, um, Tiziana Posemato. I hope yes, that was correct. correct. Yeah. Um, Tiziana holds a degree in philosophy from La Sapienza Rome, uh, diplomas in uh, archival science and library science from the Vatican Schools, and a master's degree in library science from the University of Florence. She has led numerous projects for library automation, analysis, mapping, conversion, and for the transformation in linked open data and the publication of catalog data from numerous institutions. She is the Chief Information Officer of Casalini Libri and founding managing partner of ATCult, or yeah, ATCult. All right, uh, and she will talk about share VDP. Please. Okay, thanks for the invitation for inviting me to present uh, the state of the art of the project and some highlights on data model. Uh, uh, the ShareVD project is a, a research uh, and uh, um, uh, is, is, is a research project and it involved uh, some, uh, a, a large number of uh, um, libraries in uh, uh, North of um, America, and uh, uh, we, the project has the goal to uh, uh, convert, to mapping, to convert, to reconcile, to convert data from MAC 21 to linked open data using GigaFrame as main ontology and publish data on a, a portal so that data can be used not only from machine, by machine, but also from human. Um, the Shelby D uh, uh, created uh, some uh, group to analyze uh, data and uh, to discuss uh, some items uh, and some uh, topics. Uh, and uh, the Shelby D Transformation Council has the role to provide uh, insight and analysis of the mark to be the transformation, to make recommendations for improvement. Uh, based on requirement defined and expressed by a particip participant. Um, the, uh, the Transformation Council lead also some uh, subgroup that are focused on specific area. The first one is uh, the Work Identification Working Group. The correct name probably is uh, the Entity Identification work Working Group because uh, it, uh, this group is discussing now the scenes and uh, the identification of work as an entity, but it will continue, uh, continue for example, uh, discussing uh, the instance in, the, uh, in, in a union catalog, so something different by an instance from one catalog. And uh, the second group is the Authority Identifier Management Service Working Group, and the Cluster Knowledge Base Interaction Editor Working Group, this is a new subgroup, is studying how to improve the project to make possible the interaction between the final result of a commission that is a cluster knowledge base and the way to edit, to work on this uh, linked open data environment. And, and the last group is the User Experience and User Interface Working Group that I will present a bit more in detail because it's interesting <coughs> in terms of this topic of this session. This is the participation institution list and uh, uh, we consider two different uh, uh, type of participation. 
One is uh, as full members with the some uh, possibility to work in to the project and uh, the other type of participation is the uh, D4P cohort universities uh, with uh, some other attribution and some other opportunities. And uh, just to give you an overview about the deliverable that we promised as group, I think about, I speak about we as group, not as a company. This is very important because this is a project led by the librarians and the library, not by company. And uh, this is uh, the, an overview about the deliverable that we promised in this project. That is, uh, uh, the first one is uh, the entities reconciled in data set and linked to shared DD project to URIs. And so the first deliverable is strictly related to the second one, that is the cluster knowledge base that is available both in a, a more traditional environment in a relationship, in the relation database and in uh, RDF, so uh, is uh, the final result of reconciling entities and the conversion in RDF. The third database is uh, the data set of each library converted the BIB frame uh, using external URIs included. Uh, so not only the shared DD URIs, but also BIA, FISNIA, Wikidata, and so on. And the fourth one is the Mark 21 version of D3. That means the Mark 21 enriched with a long list of URIs useful for each library. So in relation to what the, each library need to do with this Mark 21. The status of deliverable at May 2019 is, as you can see, uh, we um, produce uh, the uh, deliverable one, two, and four for all members, uh, both uh, full, um, for full members, and uh, the uh, deliverable one and two for uh, cohort members. And uh, what comes next, uh, we are working on deliverable three, that is uh, something in progress uh, and uh, uh, as soon as possible uh, the bibliographic data of the full members will be uh, available on the shared BD online portal so that also human uh, can use them and uh, we are also working working on some optimization on startup triple store in progress uh, so probably we need to provide some updates uh, release of data set in addition to this we are working in extend our mapping with bib frame 2.0 so again the new bib frame data set will provide to each bib library so that they can have something updated about this so moving forward what are our uh, first and main uh, topic on which we are working as shared DD extension. So the cluster knowledge base editor is something very, very important because it's strictly related also to another concept of authority management and services. So how we can work out, libraries can work on authority services using the cluster knowledge base that is a, a knowledge base uh, of entities um, following the BIB frame model. So a, a, a list of re, uh, API layer, this is very important to us and uh, for libraries because this will make possible to integrate the shared DD results with the ILS, local ILS, or with other services such as interlibrary loan services and so on. So make uh, the shared DD more usable in addition to, to linked open data that are for their nature usable. but and make possible a more in deep uh, integration. And so a list of reporting to serve library needs, for example, what happened when some, someone changed something in the cluster knowledge base, what can happen in the related record, original record that provide, the library provide and so on. And from a political viewpoint, uh, we are trying uh, to make uh, Shell BD a more uh, international project, involving uh, some important uh, libraries such as uh, the, the National Library in North Europe uh, uh, countries or in Europe countries and other interesting libraries. And uh, so, uh, as, uh, from an, uh, yes, um, a strategies also to make Shell BD trusted source of identifier. 
So uh, just a few words about uh, the Shell VDE user interface design, because uh, this gave us the occasion to review our data model. And so we started this growth of analysis, uh, this kind of analysis, uh, having in mind the end user as target of the portal and uh, trying to propose uh, some services uh, with a special focus on the relationship and entities that Library of Congress made, um, that uh, Linked Data makes available in this context. And so we um, start with some questions. So do we have uh, this kind of a relationship in our data model? Model. For example, do we have original works about Shakespeare? Do we have, for example, uh, the related people related to William Shakespeare? Or do we have, for example, related original works <coughs> in our data and so on? So this kind of analysis gave us the occasion to review the Shelby D data modeling following the suggestion coming from this question, these functions, and also, of course, following the suggestion that we received from the library. And above all, for the cluster knowledge base, as you can see, I, I give you some, um, some slides uh, just to give you an idea about what the cluster knowledge base is and how it can evolve. So we start from our first draft of the shared VD model, very, very simple. And now we are working in extend this kind of data model. This is the current one. one. It's not so visible, but for example, in the center of the, uh, of the uh, model, you, we fi you find a super work that is something that is very close and related to work in LL. LLM, exact, that is important for a union catalog to grow up a different original work coming from a person, from a, a, an agent. Or for example, this is the future model, where you find here the manager of distance, that is something different when you manage a one catalog of one library, so you can imagine that each bibliographic record will produce one instance, but it's very different when you put together data coming from different libraries where each library has own description of an instance. So we are thinking to include a, a, a different kind of uh, uh, entity such as an instance or something that is related to what we are uh, calling a master instance that is exactly the instance in Bib frame but that make possible to see Okay, this is the master instance, this is the instance in Bibo frame, but you can find different description of this instance in each library. So we need, for example, another kind of properties that is not still present in Bibo frame to relate an instance with some description on the same instance. So a large reviewing of this model that <laughs> give us also the occasion to enlarge our collaboration. These are just some uh, institutions on projects with which we work and we are uh, uh, working for this project, uh, Labor Congress, OCLC, DMB, uh, BF and so on, and with some of them the cooperation is more strictly and specialized on some a specific topic, for example, LD4P, ISNI, Wikidata, for which we obtain a property to link Wikidata with Shelby the data, and for example, with Folio, an interesting in collaboration with Folio, and this is related to master instance, to instance, to put all together items coming from different libraries and with uh, library services. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, please. Yes. Um, so, so do I understand correctly that you're looking at this as um, a, a union catalog, right? And so, what is the and so how do you envision um, its relationship with our with our iOS systems? Yes, this is one of our. Uh, most important topic for us uh, and, and is related to uh, the APIs layer and uh, uh, for example one important uh, um, 
answer in this is uh, um, uh, to create, to build a, a set of APIs uh, to link and to be used, for example, by ILL systems such as BoroDirect or other kind of system to I, uh, for ILL. So uh, another important aspect is, for example, uh, because in the portal you can start in a union catalog in a in a shared environment, but after you will arrive to each specific opac of each library. So in this case, uh, you can have a, a more integrated, a more uh, uh, in deep integration between the opac and shared VDE, proposing some services in the uh, in the uh, shared VDE layer, some services that can be. Uh, provided by each OPAC and vice versa. So in the future, also starting from single OPAC, you can start a query in shared VD and retrieve data. Another kind of integration is, for example, proposing specific skin, uh, speci specific uh, skins starting from shared VD so that when a user select a single library, for example, Stanford and so on, a specific skin not only in term of graphical user interface but also in terms of services can be provided so a more in deep integration with the library with each library oh this is a not is not an easy uh, question because uh, the question affects a, a lot of different aspects. So uh, uh, we provide a model to be part of the community in different uh, layer of participation. Uh, so with uh, some, uh, probably Michele can explain better than me, but uh, we also provide some components of the project in open source. For example, the, uh, the layer of instances <coughs> that we uh, consider master instance in term, uh, as I told you before, will be totally in open source uh, so that each library can be used. And this is a, a step to integrate uh, with Folio, for example. And also the cluster knowledge base editor will be totally in open source because uh, each uh, institution <coughs> has to be free to reuse and uh, to use this editor to work with its open data because when we have in mind linked open data, we have in mind something that is available for all the words. So the project is a bit complex to explain in few words, uh, in English to me, <laughs> in, in, in adding some, some type of uh, uh, difficult, but uh, we can give you all information of, about how uh, join the project, what kind of components you can have for free and what kind with the subscription and so on. Apps are ah, other technology partner and institutions. Mm -hmm. You mean the Folio project has EBSCO on it, but the Share VDE project does not. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I'm asking who are the, the, the corporate partners behind, behind this project? Kathleen Beaver and Echo. Okay. Ah, sorry, because of the first slide was cancelled for uh, to respect the time. So yes. As company, Casalini Libre and Cart as a technological uh, company uh, is providing the help to, to really realize this project. Um, would the super work identifiers also be part of the data that will be available? Yes. Here? Will there be any restrictions on consumers of linked data as to you know being making it further available? No, 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 okay. as, no, no, absolutely. And in the way that, you know, old metadata in the past has actually come with a provider, you can only put it in your catalog, you can't give it to anybody else, mm -hmm. which was almost impossible to <laughs> us, please. <laughs> and prevented us from actually buying some, some resources because. Yeah. Metadata, metadata wants to be free. Without yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Also because as usually also discussing with the Library of Congress and other important institutions or institutions that 
uh, uh, take part to this project uh, uh, is absolutely impossible to realize something in terms, for example, of works, super works as LRM without a larger contribution by each institution. Mm -hmm. So it's not possible to, to be declared the uh, owner of this uh, uh, concept or end of this data because it's uh, the result of a larger contribution. Thank you. We have time for one more question. was started by two guys. Their business model was to start with, well, that's, that's not it. Maybe we were not interested to know that, that okay, so we're gonna have a centralized service to maybe Wiki, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, and is this a centralized service to, will it be decentralized? Okay, we, uh, I don't know if I understood the question, so yeah. the last question, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, uh, uh, we propose a both model, because we propose a centralized mod model uh, as a shared BD, and we, we hope that shared BD, cluster knowledge base, and data will be trusted data for all community as own, uh, as a central uh, uh, project, but in the same time, as I told you, uh, showing the deliverable, we deliver uh, 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 the cluster knowledge base and uh, each uh, library, single library data set to each uh, library uh, that take part to the project. So each library is free, totally free, to use their data and to get and to publish in all kind of uh, sites and uh, as they want. So uh, from our side, we try, we are trying to to have in mind a centralized uh, uh, project to be sure that more and more libraries will take part to the project, enlarging the richness of the data. But in the same time, each library is autonomous and can do with their data what they want. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this answer to your question. It was just a clarification that, because we were talking about Wikipedia and the lack of resources, yeah. and Wikipedia was started by two persons and, and who made their money in the photographic industry. Yeah. Which, for some people, is fine, it's not yes. Yes. or whatever. The fact that we as librarians are going to relate on, on, on those kind of models. Okay. We, we hope that this is just an invite to become as a Wikidata, so a yeah. spreadsheet in the world. <laughs> so this is, a, we hope that uh, we start with uh, some libraries and we hope to enlarge the community and make available services for all. So the, the, and the central ownership will be the foundation or an association of of libraries, yes, of libraries. This is important message to us to give. Thank you. Thanks. So um, I'll take a moment to set the facts uh, straight since I'm in a position to do so. You seem very upset by the fact that Jimmy Wales used to have a soft porn business. That's true. He did not use that money to, to fund Wikipedia. He was an already wealthy man who made his money as a day trader stock exchange. The ph pornography business was <laughs> unsuccessful. <laughs> just, to, just to clarify that. Um, and, and in terms of uh, where Wikipedia's money comes from, just FYI, we rely on donations, not on pornography and not on Jimmy's own money. Um, uh, more than 75% of our budget is individual donations, $5, $10 from, from people like you. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's that. And so, the space, the space needed is, is, is if you 
well to be here and do the search on the two founders of Wikipedia. It, it's well, it, it's that you see. Yeah, he did. Jimmy Wales did have a sophomore business. He also had a real estate site. He had a bunch of internet ventures. Yeah. But I don't know why that's no, so. I'm just referring to what you say. You I'm not saying it's not true. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. Um, just that it's not the money that was used to start Wikipedia. Okay, okay. so uh, the next talk is by radio. Uh, it's actually in person, but it's by Eric Radio. <laughs> <laughs> that was not my joke. No, no, that's <laughs> I'm, res I'm responsible for that horrible thing. I hope I can do better. Do you want to be horrible? Um, oh, no, you do. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I got ahead of myself. <laughs> So uh, Eric is the metadata librarian at the University of Colorado Boulder, uh, where his fo work focuses on digital collections and developing metadata infrastructures. His presentation is going to explore approaches to capturing aspects of time and change as linked data by examining the intersection of philosophical theories of time, experimental models, and standards. Hi, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Eric Radio um, at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, my Twitter handle is up there if you want to ask me questions during this. You can also just ask me questions at the end or whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, but today I'm going to be talking about a survey of time based approaches to basically serializing RDF and related approaches too. And the question um, initially is why do we care about time and why do we think RDF is potentially an answer to whatever that question might be? And so to frame this, I want to talk about um, a digital collection that I ran into, and this is kind of indicative of a larger trend that I've seen on just my work. So this is the Arapaho Glacier from the NSIDC Glacier Collection, which is housed at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, this is right in uh, just Boulder's backyard. So this is the glacier from August 1997. And you can see from less than a decade later, it's kind of dramatically reduced in size. And so what stood out to me is that like these are amazing images. Um, but there's no narrative being told between these two images unless someone is out there looking for that narrative to be there. So there's not really a clear trajectory to get that gets you from here to there. And so tracking that identity over time is kind of the main crux of how we track trying to change um, throughout uh, an information object existence. And information objects do change over time, as do the things that they represent. And so uh, I think another similar example of something that changes over time is an institutional repository. Departments change names seemingly every day for some reason. People go in and out of universities um, and other changes like that. But there's always kind of a collapsing of what we can see those changes into what I call a unidimensional kind of flat now picture where we just try to write it all down but not have any relationality between how those things interact with each other. So we talk about linked data as supporting and aggregating disparate resources. And a key factor of that is, of course, identity. And so I thought, well, why not explore how linked data and RDF and related languages can tie time and change together to allow for an accurate picture of an information resource to be described over time. So this is the survey, not in like a formal sense of I sent surveys out, but more of like an archaeological survey of where, what's happened before and kind of where I think that positions us right now. And so um, to do that, I'm going to be talking about the main philosophical models of time that um, inform kind of this survey and then see how those theories have been executed as models, and then quickly situate them historically, and then see um, how they're being used by standards. Um, and then I think what this really allows us to do is see what I understand to be a, kind of a gap between those three areas, and on, I'll, conclude explaining, I'll conclude by explaining why I think that is, and kind of what kind of the subtext of what I found is. Um, so there's really no shortage of writings on uh, philosophy of time. Uh, there's a lot of theories out there, and it's really varied, and there's not really any attempt, to, any attempt to cover all of those in like 20 minutes would be really not possible. Um, but what I found in doing my survey from models is that most of them relate themselves back to these two models, endurantism and perduratism, um, which both make use of something called a temporal part. And so I'm going to start with endur uh, endurantism. And this model basically says um, that an object is only fully existent in the present moment. Um, so if you had, like, let's say, a monographic series, that same series that contains 10 volumes this year is not the same series that contains 11 volumes next year. Same thing with the Arapaho Glacier. That glacier from 1997 is not actually the same glacier that we see right now. Um, so I call this the traveler, kind of in a Marty McFly sense, um, because any time he goes to is the only one that exists in his frame of reference. That's all there's there. Now, of course, he knows there's other timelines, but he can only see what's available to him. Um, so key, bottom line there is endurance has maintained that no matter what time is the present, if an object exists at that time, it is fully present and doesn't have parts that extend into the future or the past, the temporal part idea. Moving on to perdurantism, um, 
This is the FOIL, which basically says that an object does have different temporal parts that are equally existent, whether they're in the past, present, or future. Um, so that glacier, is, the Arapaho Glacier, is actually still the same Arapaho Glacier, even though it's changed over the series of pictures. And I call this one the observer, but I don't really have a good movie analogy for it, so if you think of one, let me know. Um, but basically the idea is that if you could step outside of time and view it as an unaffected observer, looking at something like the Bayou Tapestry, um, then you can see how the event is depicted over time and track the narrative that way. So further models do allow for others to have parts that do not all exist at one time. Um, and so both positions make use of that concept of the temporal part, and that concept really relies on a pretty big assumption that changes to an object over time can be clearly demarcated. And as we'll see on closer examination, that's um, pretty problematic, and I'll get to that in a little bit, um, because that distance between a temporal part becomes increasingly fuzzy the more you look at it. And so I'll cl quickly close this section by just saying that the adoption of a particular model, whether it's endurantism or perturantism, doesn't mean that we're actually changing reality, and this is really important. We're just simply creating a representation of reality, and that has pretty deep implications for how you want to describe an object. So moving on to the different models I found, um, there's a lot of nuance between uh, the different models I'm going to talk about now. Um, so I provide citations on some of the slides and at the end so you can read further. Um, I split these up to align with endurantism and perturantism just because that's how um, these were frequently described in the, in the literature. Um, I should also note that I'm eliminating my, myself to models that were published in some way or derivatives of something that was published um, as having the highest visibility. Uh, so there's certainly more that are, that are just here, but these kind of represent the broadest strokes I could find. So the first one is um, owl time, which is uh, unfortunately there's no owls, um, but there is time. And this is the W3C recommendation for describing temporal characteristics of resources on the web. It's also, to my knowledge, one of the earliest attempts at it. Um, and it makes use of the idea of the temporal entity, and a temporal entity can have an instant or an interval, basically. So instants we're all familiar for. It's also a time point. So if you had an embargo lifted at a certain time, that's it. There's no interiority. It's just that one instant. Um, the interval is kind of the, not quite the opposite, but they're durational in scope and kind of, of course, show a duration of beginning and end. Uh, interesting, this ontology does not actually articulate whether time is ordered in a linear fashion, which seems to be kind of um, an interesting omission. Um, and then further, it doesn't specify whether you can have multiple instants between a particular duration, between two instants. Um, and I call this one an endurance perspective because while there are aspects of resource that can designate a time or a temporal part or a duration, these markers are, are themselves really instantial. Um, so the resource is really only itself in the present, and the features can only be true during certain intervals. Moving on to temporal graphs, this was a little bit later, um, and this was kind of an effort to identify two issues. Uh, this, this group initially, uh, uh, initially looked at taking a snapshot of a graph um, at a given point in time, and then when there's a change, taking another picture and then storing the previous version, which seems like an okay solution to kind of being able to track how something's changed over time. But the problem is that it doesn't allow you to actually pose queries and to interrogate when a particular condition could be true. And there's also a lot of data to manage after taking a picture of a graph um, in various intervals. Now again, this is from you know, 2005 to 2007, so maybe that's less of an issue, but in my experience, these graphs can still get pretty unwieldy. Um, so that's just a lot of data to maintain. So what Gutierrez and all said basically is that Instead of that, let's propose a method by which we tri uh, label triples to indicate when they're true in the real, real world. And from there, you can reconstruct the graph. Uh, but it doesn't actually install a relationship between the previous iterations of itself. So you have to rely on the version that you're querying um, as an enduring object at that time. Kind of an interesting spin-off of this happened several years after this by Modic in 2012, who noted that validity time, which is the time that um, a database statement can be true in the world, um, it's not supported by RDF or OWL, so you couldn't actually query it through Sparkle to begin with, which is also a big problem. Um, so what he proposed was entailment, um, which was basically a method by which cascading statements can be true and then mapping those to first order queries. Uh, and further, they extended the query language to allow basically maximal and minimal conditions at which point a statement could be true. A uh, third model I want to talk about from the endurance side is tense binary relations. This is a really interesting article. I'd encourage you to read it. There's a lot in it. Um, but basically the idea here um, was the, trying to examine the capability of expressing a tensed relationship in OWL. Um, and basically how can you express a ternary relationship in which everything is binary? Um, so moving then to the perturantist models, um, there's really just two that, I, that stood out to me. So tell, I'm not actually sure if that's how people talk about it, but T OWL doesn't sound as fun. So um, it stands for Temporal Web Ontology Language. Uh, this model is designed to make explicit diachronic relations of objects through temporal infrastructure and change. 
Um, so temporal infrastructure concerns how time is codified. It also uses instants and intervals as its core um, kind of methods to enable an ordering to time. Um, and then there's change, which contains more considerations on the levels of the entity and the relation. So an entity can have an attribute change as well as its relationship to another entity chain. What you need to do this is basically an ability to indicate what holds true at a given time, which seems to be a recurring issue through all of these. And so what they said um, was there's this idea of a fluent, which is a property that holds at a given time. But those problem with fluents are that um, to make one, you have to have two temp temporal parts to demarcate the change, which gets really unruly. So they move the temporal argument away from the fluent and to the time slice um, to kind of whittle that down. And then next is Memento. Um, this is actually just a protocol. It doesn't like officially use RDF, but it leverages URIs to link together different instances of web resources. So I would call it link data adjacent, and RDF systems like uh, Fedora do support it. Um, so the protocol consists of four main components, the, um, the original resource, which is the resource that you're interested, and uh, the Memento, which are previous versions of a resource, uh, the time gate, which connects different versions, and then a time map, which references the time gate to bring you back something. So I call this one Perdurant because um, it does rely just basically on time slices that can be queried and retrieved, so you can still kind of step outside of it and see the options available to you. So moving now, the question is, oh, this is uh, just a quick situation of how these things have um, kind of came in over the last 20-ish um, years. Uh, I think the takeaway here for me is that while it initially started out with very endurantist things, there's been more kind of Perdurantist models in recent past, but I don't know if that's necessarily indicative of a trend that's yet, there's not enough examples. Um, so the question then is, how, oh wow, okay, we're getting there. Okay, standards. So um, how do standards use these models? The quick answer is they don't. Um, so, I, um, <laughs> um, so all this work doesn't mean it's for nothing, but this is just kind of how I've situated this on this endurance and perverse access. I know Wikidata is not officially standard, but I'm not really quite sure what to call it, um, but it's an interesting addition to this discussion. So my quick take, my quickly my takeaways are, um, what have we learned so far from this is that we've fallen into a binaristic trap basically in thinking that there's only two ways of representing time. Um, they both rely on a concept that um, time can be split evenly into different parts and that's um, not necessarily true. And so the difficulty in discussing time is that human perception of time is not necessarily reflective of its nature. Um, language is designed to articulate clear concepts but not everything in the world is clear cut. Um, and so I introduced a third um, model of time called epicalism, not apocalism, um, but it sounds like it. And this model just basically says that reality is ultimately emergent. There is no reducible now that you can say things happen at, which is quite interesting. So it questions the linearity or the succession of time in these frameworks. And basically what this model says too is that you can't actually divide time, you can only divide spatial aspects of an, in, of a, of an object, which is quite different. Um, and so I don't have a method um, of serializing epicalism and RDF. It doesn't mean there's one out there, but I just bring it up to show how easy it was to fall into this thinking that there's just endurantism and perdurantism as things we can think about. Um, so my conclusion basically from this is, um, what do we do now? Uh, well, that's not my conclusion, that's a question. Um, so uh, let me get my quick notes. So um, I think that there's three areas of that, of that needs reconciliation. I think one is to complicate the question of time, even though it's already complicated, but as you can see, there's definitely different models that could be applied in a given situation. I think kind of moving past that binary framing is kind of um, concerning because it makes us ask, well, if we can't even decide between two models, what does that mean for interoperability? And I think whenever interoperability comes up, we need to ask who is it interoperable for and what is kind of the irreconcilable differences if we do one thing versus another. Um, also, I think questioning uh, which model of time is to be used for uh, supposes that one is actually more accurate than another, um, and I think that, that there's no compatibility, and I don't think that's actually true. I think more that these are variations on each other. Um, so I think the existence of many models suggests that different lenses can be applied to illuminate a particular area of concern more clearly than another one. Um, second, I think that the approaches that we saw were very heavily biased towards those, top, those two models um, and oriented along them oriented themselves along it, but I think that the interstitiality kind of indicated by epicalism introduces more complexity to serialization that's less easily afforded by the binarism that computers do very well. Um, and so then finally, you know, why haven't standards engaged? I think there's a lot of really good reasons and a lot of really complicated reasons. I think interoperability is another question that probably comes up there, but I do think it's an underexplored area for, um, for standards community and that the absence kind of obfuscates fuller narrative telling um, of information objects over time. 
So my, not, my, my recommendation is not that we think, get all our heads together and think of one temporal model that exists for everything, because I don't think that's actually reflective of what's happening, um, but rather that a model that can cascade into different lenses would actually be more useful and prudent. And so I'm um, kind of moving away from a problematic universalizing way of gathering everything under one time umbrella, but saying how do these relate to each other and what are, how is it more of a variation rather than a conflict? Um, and so I think kind of the good question to ask kind of whenever we're looking at this is, not how do we find a correct representation of time, but how does your the time you how does your model of time support the argument of the information that you're trying to present to somebody? And so here's just further reading. So thank you. Thank you for this uh, stimulating talk. We have time for questions. Would anyone like to ask questions? <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay. I fill the space. So, um, this is, I, I thank you. It's, it's really interesting that you don't often think about that concept or that conceptualization of time within our bibliographic records. Um, so, I'm doing some work now with Indigenous uh, communities and data. And so, one of the things that we're current, going to be grappling with is the concept of time. Both, there's issues that some of our data changes over time, but then also how do we consider actually like different concepts of time? Like the way that time is, is conceptualized in our systems is very much along a very Western kind of idea. So I don't know if you've encountered anything that was thinking outside even a Western conceptualization of time. Uh, that's a really good point, and yeah, you're right, you hit the nail on the head that I, these are starting from very Western-centric. Epicalism is all Alfred North Whitehead, which is early 20th century. Um, and I th but I think that that's um, one area that there wasn't a lot written about that for kind of very obvious reasons, kind of Eurocentrism or white Western centrism kind of drowning out the narrative. And I think that that's an important thing to leverage. Um, I, have, I don't have like a citation off the top of my head, but I think that I think it's back to the point that it's like we don't need to necessarily be thinking about how do we provide a model for everyone to use, but like how could a particular community use their own model to express that narrative in a way that isn't in conflict with kind of um, a more Western-centric narrative type of style of telling something. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, so a, 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 a discovery problem that's been with us a long time and may surface more as we move away from our standard vocabularies and, and start to explore other ways of surfacing aspects such as topic, uh, as well as estimated data for creation, for very old objects where, where we, don't, we don't really know, but we, we can sort of place it between two dates. Mm -hmm. Do you have any, any thoughts about how systems could utilize ways of expressing eras or, or time spans that would be more useful to enable people to better uh, retrieve what they're looking for? Yeah, I, I definitely run into that a lot because, you know, you, you want to say it, it's around this time, but the system won't take something like around. And so I think that's one of that area that kind of that, when everything boils down to just a binary sort of framing of things, that doesn't really support any of that. So I, one thing I'm interested in is just how do we make a gray area and kind of go in that area. I don't have a good answer to that, um, but that's something I'm thinking about too. But I think something like Sidoc TRM does kind of approach um, time from a pretty different model. Um, and they do have more uh, preferences on it almost an ethical approach to kind of thinking about time eras and how they one thing kind of gets absorbed by something else. And that was when I was looking at the standards, I was saying things, and none, none of them really use these models. You have to look at the predicates to kind of find an inflection of a particular time model that they're using. And that one seemed much more toward oriented towards that, but it doesn't seem uh, to me that there was a lot of examples of that, at least um, in North American context that I could find on like leverage um, to support that in this presentation, which was really fast. There's another question over there. Oh, yes. So, um, uh, thanks for introducing this topic. It's brand new to me, so I can't, um, can't wait to dig into the readings. Um, the question I had was, how much do these models engage with the topic of annotation and citation? And then, you know, how might some of the uh, issues that were brought up this morning about um, looking back and looking at the metadata that might be useful? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good, it's an important point, too. Um, in the official like articles and, uh, and protocols that I read, it wasn't officially addressed, but I think it's very much at play for 
this sort of thing, and then it kind of adds another layer of complexity too when you do want to add to annotate at a given time. And then I think that that annotation can really add a level of transparency too. But I think that transparency is also a tricky thing because a lot of times we'll say that you know well you know it's in the database, so in theory you could go back and find the initial version of it. But that that's not really transparency in my mind because someone that doesn't someone might not even know they can do that, and then they have to go and do the work. So it's kind of like a glass wall basically in front of true transparency. And so it's an interesting question that um, I don't have. I don't have a lot of detail to give you right now, but I think that it's very much related. Yes. With respect to the um, glacier example you opened with, which, um, if any of these models, would accommodate what you want to do with that? Yeah. So that's something I've been thinking about too, and that's kind of why I did the study because I wasn't sure which one would actually make the most sense for a given thing. And I think that you know. When you think about the perturbances and the endurances models, they're both very much relying on that concept of the temporal part, and it's not really obvious for a glacier that's melting when something is officially something else in a glacier. Now, of course, you can put the human lens on that, and so what the scientists do is they go and take the center point of the glacier at one year, and the next year they go and calculate the center point again. And so in that sense, that there's, there actually is a demarcation, but that's a very human oriented lens on it, but I think something more like apocalypse might be actually be more applicable for that particular um, scenario. Um, yes? Uh, so I was just wondering if, whether you thought of the extended base time format and its importance is it, it's not a model really, but it's a you know, serialization of, of time, of you know, temporal um, spans in a way that tries to accommodate fuzziness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, it is one that's out there. Um, and I'm not probably not as familiar with it as you are, but I think that's one um, that can definitely be leveraged in a given context. But I guess, for, and that's what, kind of that chasm there is that there's a, like kind of a model that exists or a, or a function that exists basically, but then how does that get represented to a user is the next question. And I think that that's a whole another unexplored area, at least for me anyway, I haven't like dug into that. So I think kind of how, thinking about how we translate a model of time into a representation of time for a user is a really important um, like second part of adopting any particular type of function. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just thinking it seems like a standard like that would really benefit from the kind of intentional modeling that you're, you've been discussing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> Describe places or just differences between places? Well, the, like for a given era, it doesn't really mean the same thing in Europe as it does in Oh, for sure. It actually came in different real time. Mm -hmm. uh, no, that was not something that I saw, um, but I think that that's a good point that I think that, you know, <coughs> the importance of the linked data could really help aggregate at least partially those differences between places that have a reference in the same object but with entirely different. We have time for one last question and a brief answer. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I think that, um, you know, this survey started from a very Western-centric perspective, and that's, you know, important to capture that, but I think that it does omit everything else that it doesn't fall into that, and I think that um, I want to see that model, too, but I think that it's going to really require a lot of, it would require a lot of participation from those different perspectives to actually make sure that it becomes variations and not contradictions. All right, thank you very thank much. You. but I, I have some comments on the Wikidata approach to this that I can maybe share later at the break or if we have some time at the final Q&A. So uh, moving right along, um, our next speaker is uh, Bob Allen. Um, he will talk about rich semantics and direct representation. Uh, Dr. Allen did doctoral work at UCSD and then research on user interface design, neural nets, and information science at Bell Labs and later at Bellcore. He was the editor-in-chief of the ACM Transactions on Information Systems 
and eventually chair of the ACM Publications Board. Starting in 98, he became a professor in several LIS programs, including Maryland, Drexel, and most recently at Yonsei University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, he's now living in New York City. I'd like to thank the, the Mellon Foundation and the organizers for inviting me to this presentation. Uh, this is a very big picture presentation in contrast to some of the others, but we're going to address some of the, the same issues. We're going to talk about rich semantics and direct representation. By rich semantics, I mean, mean using semantic systems that are beyond linked data, or at least beyond the current implementation versions of linked data. There's a lot of theories about semantics that we just don't, don't ignore, that we ignore, that we don't focus on. And I'd like to talk about direct representation as being, we're going to actually get rid of text. We want to build the knowledge base. We're going, that is, if you can imagine a science article, the science, there's a lot of structure in the science article. We could represent the whole article as a knowledge base, as a structured knowledge. So these are big, ambitious goals. We're going to talk about them in, in uh, two, two cases, two primary examples, uh, modeling historical communities based on uh, historical newspapers, and then the, going into more detail about the scientific articles, the scientific publications. I'll talk about it very quickly, of course, about a few uh, frameworks and implementations. We don't need to see this one. <laughs> So uh, starting about uh, 12 years ago, I was working on the, trying to support access to the Library of Congress NDNP collection. NDNP is the Digitized Historical Newspapers. Uh, they had a beautiful collection of millions of pages of historical newspapers. Um, they OCR'd it, they, they digitized it, OCR'd it through the OCR into a search engine, and we got the Chronicling America website. Um, this is, has a lot of uh, nice features, but uh, also gives some very peculiar results. So instead of getting a nice set of articles about, say, the Brooklyn Bridge, you get pictures of the boats passing under the Brooklyn Bridge, you get the Brooklyn subway station, and so forth. So we don't, we don't, what we'd like is some, perhaps, knowledge structured organization of this material. We want something more than just keyword searches, or full text searches with the search engine. We want to, but how do we, what kind of model would we use to add that knowledge? How, would we, how do we build a model of the community? Well, we could look at Brooklyn, but that's much more complicated, say, than Norfolk, Nebraska, a town out in the prairies that has you know, 5,000 people, and we know the businesses, we know the people. We want to build a model of that community. But how would we do that? Something uh, could use some linked data, but probably we need some, some, some sort of modeling or simulation, something beyond for the current techniques that we have. In fact, we want this model to be dynamic, much as, as uh, Eric mentioned. Uh, we, want, we want to look at the changes of the town through each day of the newspaper, and then macro changes, say, as the, the train comes to town, uh, how did the economy of that town change? Um, that's one path, one direction for the direct representation of the community models. A second direction is modeling scientific research reports. There's already a lot of structure in scientific articles. We have structured sections, now structured abstracts, research objects, but I'd like to propose that we take this to the limit, we make the whole thing structured. We could structure the scientific phenomena, we could use structured workflows, and we could use structured discourse. There actually are several possible semantic models we could apply to this. First, there's the upper ontologies. Um, in biology, there's a well-known system called the basic formal ontology, the BFO. This is used widely, more, more popular than UMLS, for uh, organizing uh, biological, bio, uh, genomic data and so forth. Um, it has uh, a, a, well, it has 
the upper ontology to describe the, the types of entities you're allowed to have, and then it has uh, instantiated, has uh, domain ontologies for specific species and specific uh, processes that, uh, you, that are based on this overall framework. So that's something we could look at. Um, in fact, some of my work is, is tries to extend that, uh, say, to the humanities. We're moving, of course, from a very Aristotelian scientific framework to a humanities framework is a big step, but we can try to do that. The second approach would be semantic roles. Um, there's a frame that project, frame semantics. This is a project from Berkeley with uh, Charles Fillmore. Of course, we know if we make a statement, we have agents and objects. We have some sort of processes. We want to find those relationships. Well, how do we, how would we incorporate that into our models? We want some sort of agency, and we want it to maybe look something like what, what linguists have found out for verbs. Finally, there's the whole world of programming languages. Um, in some sense, a lot of temporal effects are processes. And of course, uh, what we really, if we want to model processes, that's what basically what programs do. They, they, they build simulations. Um, what's the relationship between our knowledge, our, our knowledge graphs and the and programming languages? Um, I think they should, in fact, merge them. So I tried to build a, what I, a program, a, a language I call XFO, some sort of object-oriented modeling. Um, Great similarity between the BFO and object oriented modeling. Um, I, I propose that the, they're, they're very similar, that the, um, what, the, what the programming language does is to break relationships, breaks and remakes new relationships. So if you have well-structured relationships, you can then move through time by breaking and restructuring these relationships. Um, we, we can do modeling, we can do um, scientific models or humanities models. Here's a model of the synapse. Um, Biology these days is, called, is framed by the philosophers, the historians of science as being the new mechanists. The purpose of biology is to find pathways and processes, say, through the synapse. Uh, we want to find causal. And there's some of that work in this BFO, not enough. There's a whole separate field of systems biology, but we need, we, but that's not ontologized as well. Um, there's a second approach, a second area is humanities. We can look at uh, the workflows for the production of celadon. I was living in Korea for a while, so celadon is interesting to work on. Um, we can have to describe the process of producing celadon, the pottery workflow. Um, but then this is also, there's a town, the Ganjin Pottery Village, which is the people working on this, um, on this pottery. And whether the, how do the social systems adapt to the, the, to the activities of the potters? So we can have different, many different kinds of systems here. Um, we can look at the question of large vocabularies. Turns out this BFO has spawned uh, hundreds of biology ontologies. They actually have a, a framework they call a foundry. A foundry is a collection of domain ontologies. We're getting that. Um, the, um, and the, that's pretty useful, although I think we could extend it to some of these programming language ideas. A second thing we need to do is to look at humanities. Where is there a large vocabulary in humanities? Well, the Art and Architectural Thesaurus is very well curated, has fairly broad coverage. Um, I propose that we want to take the Art and Architectural Thesaurus, turn it into a rich ontology, and then further break that in, break it into separate ontologies and make a foundry out of it. So as I say, I have uh, many uh, big ideas. We want more complete community models, we want better scientific research reports, we want large-scale coordinated vocabularies, and we want services on top of all this if we have knowledge bases, then we can do text generation, AI types of things you are familiar with for, from, from uh, knowledge work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I remind you the lightning talks have questions uh, together at the end. So our next talk moving right along is by uh, Dr. Clifford Wolfman. Uh, periodicals digitization coordinator at Princeton and director of the Blue Mountain Project. We'll be talking about Ferberu. Uh, In the spirit of lightning talks, <clears throat> this is going to be 
really fast and not go into details about anything, and I need to talk to, to people afterwards. Um, this is sort of a report about a button so you can see that. Um, <coughs> this is a quick little report about a project that um, uh, I did with Allison about you and uh, some other colleagues at, at the Perseus Project last year uh, that went in a bunch of different directions. One of those directions uh, Allison is going to talk about at great length this afternoon, and I urge you to go and hear her piece. So you've got a, a larger picture of this sort of, uh, sort of strange experiment. I call it an experiment because, although this is something on implementation, it hasn't been it. Uh, but it started now as an attempt to uh, upgrade uh, the existing Perseus catalog, uh, which is a catalog of uh, uh, ancient Greek and Latin uh, texts, to be more in line with its original original purpose as Greg Crane had envisioned it, not only a bibliographic catalog of texts, but also a more philological uh, knowledge base of, I shouldn't say a bibliographic uh, catalog of books and editions, translations, versus a, uh, a more uh, uh, philological knowledge base of texts and their evolution over time. Um, Currently, that is implemented in the Perseus catalog um, in, a, in a sort of odd, odd way that it grew organically. This is a project that's almost 15 years old, um, in which metadata about books, a particular translation, edition, publication of something um, that may or may not have been digitized somewhere, uh, is also trying to represent information about texts, specific uh, editions by specific people that grew from some other edition that was written by someone and prepared by somebody earlier, translations that grew from a particular edition. As Professor Crane suggested, one of the things that philologists want to be able to do is to trace the evolution of these texts, independent of how they've been published. Well, not entirely independent. Um, so in the Perseus context, um, as a an evolved model um, ended up representing each individual text as its own separate mods record. So in the case of Aristophanes' uh, um, uh, wasps here, it happened to be one, um, uh, it's, it's uh, a, a text in a larger edition. Uh, uh, so each, each text had its own mods record. So there's one for the translation, one for the uh, edition, and so on for each of the for each of the plays, uh, a record for each with lots of duplications. So we wanted to get rid of that first of all. Um, I'm going to skip this for interests of time. If this is this is the ontology around which uh, the classical community sort of begins to think about its its materials, text groups around the vague notion of authorship, uh, works, and then editions and translations thereof. Um, it seemed to me going forward, uh, coming from so my background working with ontologies, uh, um, with magazines and newspapers, periodicals, that Ferberu was going to be uh, ideal for this purpose. I uh, won't go into the details of Ferberu for those of you who don't know, but essentially what uh, it allows, it's a, it's a harmonization of the Ferber family of uh, ontologies and the CDOC CRM uh, model. So it brings temporal in some ways brings temporality and objects to bibliography. I'm not a bibliographer. I'm not a cataloger. I'm not a librarian. I come from a bunch of other worlds. Uh, but I sort of looked at this and said, this is this is what we want because we want the, the author context, the text context, and the publisher's context, the the printed materials context to somehow be fused together. Uh, so. Uh, what we came up with, and this is the this is the big slide I'm going to break down, uh, is a layer that uh, intermediates between some earlier work uh, being done in Europe on representing uh, works and authors at a high level, abstract level, uh, in in classical philology, um, and the more base layer of uh, uh, printed materials represented in the world cat. Okay, I'm going really fast. 
So this is, this is uh, Mateo's QSIT that uh, represents, uh, essentially works for, for us as a knowledge base of works. So here we have a particular work um, represented in, in the uh, Herbaru graph. Uh, we can link into that then um, by uh, using uh, this, this dual duality of Herbaru uh, to create objects that represent a particular edition um, uh, and translation of separate works with their own expressions that are brought together into a, um, a publication expression, uh, which can then be linked to a WorldCat uh, uh, identifier or any other item at the item level. So that will allow us to make Sparkle queries against this that will unite a larger text-based notion of these texts with the, uh, the specific bibliographic items, publications that contain and carry them, uh, and then to where they can be found, digitized, or not. So that's my quick talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. The next lightning talk is by Ashlyn Sotelo and Elizabeth Miravia. Um, Ashlyn is the Director of Metadata Services at the University of California San Diego Library, where she oversees the creation and management of metadata for various collections, including tangible materials in all formats, rare books, electronic resources, digitized and born digital materials, and research data. She leads a large, technically sophisticated staff who are leaders in information management. She's hiring. <laughs> I don't know, it sounds like she's hiring. Uh, she's excited to be part of the LD4 cohort to help contribute our library experience working in RDF and creating access to open access materials uh, to a good frame envi environment. Uh, Elizabeth Miralia, uh, US San Diego Assistant Program Director and Head of Books and Serials Metadata. She focuses on bridging gaps between traditional cataloging practices and newer models of resource description. Uh, please. Right, so um, as a little background, oh, I'm Aslan. Close. <laughs> um, as part of our current LD4P Phase Two cohort, UC San Diego submitted their entire catalog for conversion to BibFrame in February of 2019. And of these, 70,000 records constitute the main focus of UCSD's specific project within the cohort, which is the description of open access materials. Open access materials. So why open access materials? Um, in addition to larger open access efforts such as OA 2020 and Metadata 2020, um, the University of California has adopted open access policies. In 2002, the UC San Francisco Academic Senate approved an open access policy. In 2013, the entire University of California adopted a policy to ensure that future research articles authored by faculty at all 10 campuses of UC will be made available to the public at no charge. And in 2015, the Presidential Open Access Policy expanded open access rights and responsibilities to all other authors who write scholarly articles while employed at UC, including non-Senate researchers, lecturers, postdoctoral scholars, administrative staff, librarians, and graduate students. And you may have heard of our recent unsuccessful negotiations with Elsevier. So we have a very real interest in open access as a strategic method for providing access to scholarly content. Um, additionally, open access, we wanted a broad participation throughout our metadata services program, and we have several units within metadata services who work on open access materials. We currently do ESIP cataloging for UC Press um, of which many are OA, and there is nowhere functional to code that something is open access um, and it's related license. And we're seeing more and more authors that are asking for CC licenses for their books. 
Uh, currently, our CC licenses live in a, a 540 field for print, but for ebooks, because of provider neutral standards, um, there's nowhere to include Creative Commons licenses. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. We also participate in DOAJ, and we have experience recording rights data in our RDF based dams, which UCSD created the data model for, which became the basis of the Portland Common Data Model, which is used by the San Vera community. Um, so some potential opportunities for OA materials um, um, include the potential to identify specific OA instances of different works, better search results equal more use, which we've had uh, direct experience with, um, and more use for OA in general, which just overall supports the model. Um, and it provides the ability to use and link to external vocabularies that can those opportunities come any number of challenges for open access materials in the model. Um, one of the most significant is actually the third, the mark mapping. So the 540 field and the 506 that often get used for restrictions and access um, are a mostly free text notes, so that's not great. And then also they map right now onto the instance level, but one thing that happens with open access materials is that those instances and those items can get locked together. And so figuring out where in the model those uh, license terms actually live has become complicated. Um, especially in the interest of not proliferating numerous descriptions across uh, the same resource. And one thing that we're looking at too is where to put the URLs. They currently live in the electronic locator um, space at the item level, but because again, because of instances and items get locked, um, there are a lot of questions about if the uh, license terms, where they should live with those things and where the URLs should live. And then again, with the uh, provider neutral cataloging, so, um, because of the way, so because that data is not always in there, and then because um, provider data cataloging collapses all of these expressions and manifestations of the same resource into one record, mm -hmm. breaking them out for the purposes of identifying open access content has proven challenging. Um, serials, as always, present their own unique issues with this. Journals often have paywall and open access content within the same work, but then if your descriptive model collapses all of those things together, how are you going to provide access to the open, describe the open access components? while also identifying the paywall components or maybe things are paywall for one institution or not another. Um, and then lastly, just some of the stuff that we're um, continuing to do while we get ready to start working in Synopia. So we have joined the PCC ISNI pilot. We have people actively creating ISNIs right now back at San Diego. Um, we've joined the non-Latin and Wikidata affinity groups. We have a lot of experience with non-Latin description both in CJK and non-CJK and are hoping to kind of start contributing to Wikidata um, pretty profusely. We have renewed our love and interest in Sparkle <laughs> as the main way to interact with our data right now. And then lastly, all of this has sort of led to a lot deeper collaboration between our MARC and non-MARC metadata units. We're very lucky that our non-MARC unit sits in the same physical space with our MARC unit, and the, the relationships have always been good, but now we're really speaking the same language, we're using the same stuff, we're cross, we're collaborating on tools, and so it's really created a much deeper cooperation between them. Yeah, and that's it. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is the Q&A period for all three Lightning Talks. Lightning Talk speakers, please come up. and. Um, no, don't sit down. Please come back. <laughs> you have questions to take. I'm talking to you. You have questions to take. Right now. Oh, yeah. Uh, any questions for the three uh, Lightning Talk speakers? Yes. Can I have a question for Clifford? Yes. About the use of Cobrel OO. Yes. It's a very complicated ontology. Yes, it certainly is. <laughs> yes. So my question is, if you are using the Cobrel OO, uh, to model all your metadata or just to solve some problems or lacking uh, of relationship in other ontologies uh, such as, uh, for example, being frame between work and expression. So just using something. Right now, this is really preliminary work, uh, growing out of work I did with magazines and, and uh, newspapers and recognizing that there's a way to connect this together. Um, using Ferber was one of the richest vocabularies for describing really complicated relations. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I see in the like data world of ontologies is we frequently get 
ourselves boxed into something that's not expressive enough. And Ferberu may go too far in the other direction for practical use, so I understand that, but for exploratory use to figure out the nuances of what one can say, there's nothing better that I've been able to find. Okay, thank you. Hey, what's the place between the place between Yes, there is. Use Ferberu because we're dealing here, in this case, with, with uh, classical texts and publications. In my magazine work, which I didn't come to talk about, <laughs> I use Pressu extensively. Yeah. And its model of serials, what a serial is, and the relationship between authorship, publication, dissemination, and, and uh, uh, issuance is crucial for periodical studies, uh, which is beginning to emerge as a field on its own. I had a question. In fact, is, is CRM, of course, is a, uh, said to be event-based. Yes. And, and I was wondering what the representation of time was for you in Ferberu. So, are, is there discrete time? And so well, <laughs> again, this was this was the beginning of an experiment. We had about nine months right. to work through this, and as Allison will explain this afternoon, the primary focus was to break some log jams in their mods field. But as we were doing that and taking apart, teasing apart what they'd done, we realized. This is what we really need to talk about. We were able to go back to Professor Crane and say, well, here's this. And after some initial skepticism about Ferberu and Molly, you know, he became intrigued. So I think funding permitted, we're next going to move on to that and begin to talk with the, the philological community, which is you know, deeply versed in, in the things they want to be able to talk about. And those temporal relationships between you know, when something supposedly was created when it was encapsulated in the manuscript that's the, 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 the main one and so forth is, is I think, is well represented in Ferberu. And maybe to just add a little clarity there, we're not you know, creating metadata in Ferberu, we are using that to pull elements and things out of the metadata. You know, so a large, I mean, the metadata was created in mods and in basic standards, which made, allowed it to be done quickly, and then we're using the ontology to pull the semantic data out of that put it in something else for search. And, yeah, no, I was I was unconvinced at first to try and create new data in ontology, but I'm, I'm, I'm moving. So Even in marvelous yeah, things, which... Things slowly towards expanding my notion of how to create data. So. Even marvelous things with XQuery and an XML database when you've got XML data. So that's what we did as an initial. So these are it's derivative data as opposed to primary data mm -hmm. for now, but obviously it's going to go other ways. Other questions? <laughs> Com comments are also acceptable. It doesn't have to be in question form. Well, I have a question about the newspaper stuff then. Sure. Um, that sense of being able to uh, locate what's essentially semantic modeling at a deep level in a, in a community base is fascinating. It sort of seems to me beyond the scope of my conception of what we can do with semantic modeling now. How do you see working towards that? Given that this morning we heard suggestions that interpretations need to be more contextualized than those of us who did AI 30 years ago <laughs> uh, sure. were thinking. Well, first there's the uh, biological or bio biological systems, and the, there there is some understanding that um, organisms in embryology, that organisms will change through time. There's a sequence of activities, so there are some. Uh, Ideas we can work from for there, from, from there. But I think of this actually, in the, ultimately, as more of a kind of simulation. That mm -hmm. is, we're going to uh, not do like data in, the, in this current sense. We're going to be moving to some something that's more like uh, programs that ch change. They have threads of uh, different <laughs> things going on at different times. So it's a, it's a very different world, and I'm not sure how it gets actually gets instantiated into the, the like data, the current like data world. <laughs> Yeah, there was a question. Yeah. I, I was just going to throw out a comment that's not directly related to any particular thing, but the uh, Getty Vocabularies um, documentation on how they model everything has a section on estimated dates, and uh, it's vocab.getty.edu slash doc, and it's just interesting reading on how essentially all the modeling decisions they made to create a rather large data set, which has come up in this discussion. Uh, 
Um, I have a quick question uh, for you. Um, I've, I've observed in, in the volunteer communities of Wikimedia a frequent um, idea about uh, GLAM institutions, about memory institutions, uh, that I think is a misconception, but I want to articulate it here, which is that they don't care enough about enforcing the public's access to knowledge in the sense that they don't do enough work to prevent or avoid what uh, free culture volunteers call copy fraud, that is asserting copyright over things that are not in fact copyright, right? Misrepresenting the public domain, thereby effectively limiting the public domain, uh, technically illegally. Um, so um, I think what you just uh, described about like, you know, where do, we, where do we even put it in the mark? Where do we even put it in the bit frame? Um, is, is something that the user community, of course, is unaware of. Um, my question to you is, how much attention or resourcing is being given to this particular problem that uh, free culture activists really care about? Like making sure only things that need to be limited are limited. Well, I think right now because we're part of the cohort, personally for us, um, a lot. But it is challenging because you are balancing um, providing resources towards resources that you're spending a lot of money on and then the open access. So it is a balancing act, but I think the more that we have opportunities like this one, we really can have a focused devotion of our resources towards these kinds of efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Uh, I don't know if you can answer about Wikidata, something about Wikidata. Oh yeah, I could. Because, uh, I could try. Okay, because usually uh, institutions are interested in Wikidata to retrieve identifiers. But I don't know if uh, someone is interested to use a Wikidata model to implement something. So if the Wikidata model has an interest out of... Oh yeah, um, there are... Uh, did you want to take that? Oh no, you... There, there are multiple uh, people using the Wikidata uh, technology, first of all, the, the semantic wiki technology that, that's called Wikibase. Uh, so you could, you could download Wikibase, it's free software, and you could start your own Wikidata-like site, meaning you could define properties, you can start linking items, quite apart from Wikidata, right? Your own thing, your own ontologies, etc. You could also federate it via, via federated Sparkle queries with other things, including Wikidata. That way you can have complete control over how you model your data and uh, federate and link to, to other linked data. So people are doing that. There are, um, 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 what was the, did you know, do you know some, some examples of? Well, well, that, that's, a, I mean, yeah. that, that's for Wikibase, but there's also uh, projects to consume uh, data. Of course. So just right now in the, the knowledge panels, uh, talk. There was um, Dan Scott was talking about the way that he's uh, implemented consuming Wikidata in the context of Evergreen to produce knowledge panels. Mm -hmm. So there's it's not just uh, linking our collections, but there are ways to also consume Wikidata and then using Wikibase as a subset to uh, federate. And just to whoops, just to give you a super quick visual example, there is a project called Wikigenomes. Uh, no? Yeah. Ooh, and it's offline right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is unfortunate. Well, um, there's, and there's Scolia. So there's uh, yeah, places using um, uh, and, and uh, University of um, Indiana. Kind of, it, they're using it in their in their context of scholarly communication. So using. Uh, Wikidata to assist with um, servicing um, their faculty and publications and things, so you can actually uh, enhance um, visibility and then and then also consume it in the context of your repository. Yeah, so this is basically a browser of of uh, scholarly communications data, entirely fed by Wikidata. Everything you see here comes from Wikidata or is a representation of data from Wikidata. So about this scholar, Terry Brandecic, happens to be the founder of Wikidata. Uh, you can see what he's published, where he's been publishing. You can have these little auto-generated graphs of his productivity. Uh, those, those weak years in 2013, 14, that's when he was working on Wikidata. That's why he wasn't publishing as much. Um, and you can see uh, where he's publishing and who he collaborated with and 
topics, etc. And all of these are clickable so that you can, you know, uh, uh, drill down and look at his collaborators, look at the institutes he worked in. This is just one application in the very specific field of scholarly communications over Wikidata. This Wikigenomes thing, which you can look up later, is an entirely different thing. It's for, for uh, biologists and geneticists, and you can browse individual bacteria down to the individual protein level, and each of the proteins has a Wikidata entity, uh, and so you can you know, see what other bacteria share these proteins. I know nothing about biology, but it's a very impressive application if you look at it and see that that and this were both built on top of Wikidata, showing the, the power of Wikidata as a platform. Any other questions for our Lightning Talk speakers? Yes. Um, and if this will be covered in the sessions mm -hmm. uh, directly on Wikidata, please tell me which one. Okay. Um, our, our library uh, and some of the staff there in the university are interested in, in um, adding to Wikipedia articles uh, about you know people that we have collections about or mm -hmm. uh, specialized knowledge. Yep. So forth, um, but um, it, it isn't clear to me how or, or, or what of the editions to Wikipedia articles gets propagated to Wikidata. Or is there a, is there a pipeline? What goes into the pipeline? Short answer is tags? nothing. Oh, you have yeah. to redo it all. So with Wikidata the the idea is actually the opposite. Um, we oh. we want to feed data from Wikidata into Wikipedia, yes. and we are already doing that. So okay. on Wikipedia. The more structured parts of an article, usually on the right side, if it's a left to right language, uh, that, that, that info box on Wikipedia, uh, many of them now are already coming from Wikidata. They're not actually in the article text anymore. Uh, some of them still are. We're, we're in a process of kind of migrating those things to be fed from Wikidata. So actually, we would first want you to put your uh, uh, holdings, collections, uh, references that you have in your uh, collections on Wikidata, and then they could be used on Wikipedia. Uh, in the, indeed, they could be used on Wikipedias, not just English Wikipedia. All Wikipedias could use the same code to uh, draw resources from Wikidata, and they would appear in the local language, which is one of the uh, features of Wikidata. Uh, since you asked about where, you are at the moment missing the introduction to Wikidata uh, talk uh, in the other room. Uh, but you know, these are your life choices. You chose to, <laughs> chose to be here. But there is an additional, there's the, the follow-up. I mean, if you, if you already know basically what Wikidata is and you don't need the basics, but you want to see some of these uh, tools and applications on top of Wikidata, that, that's the second session by Andrew Lee that you have not missed yet. So <laughs> you can think about it uh, during the break. All right, thank you very much.